everyone joined. So hello and welcome to this uh, conference today entitled A Bridge to Job, How to Support Young People's Transition to Work Since COVID-19. I'm Sophie Pornschlegel. I'm the moderator of this event today. Uh, I'm the project leader of Connecting Europe. Um, I will tell you a little bit more about this later on. Um, and I'm very happy to be here today with our partners, Startnet as well. So quickly on who is Startnet and who is Connecting Europe. Uh, Connecting Europe is a joint initiative of the European Policy Center with Stiftung Mercator to connect civil society organizations with EU decision makers and Startnet is one of our partners. Um, it's a project by the Goethe Institute with Stiftung Mercator and they also connect lots of people. They connect initiatives all across our Europe that empower young people on their transition from education to work. Uh, and so you have Startnet Italy and you have Startnet Europe. Um, and we're very happy to organize this event here today uh, with Nicola Schmidt, who will speak, and then with breakout sessions. So it will, will also be interactive for you and discuss the different issues that are connected to the transition from education to work. Quickly on the broader context of this event. So um, we all know that COVID-19 triggered quite a big economic recession. We're waiting with a recession of about 7% of GDP all across Europe. And that also means rising unemployment and more difficult labor markets. Um, we also know that the crisis has hit asymmetrically. Everyone was, uh, had to deal with the virus, but uh, the consequences will be very asymmetrical. Um, and will probably have regional imbalances and more unemployment in some countries than the others. Um, maybe we all remember a few years back where you had 40% youth unemployment in some southern European countries, which has then gone down in the past years and now will rise again. Um, so the issue is back on the political agenda, especially here in Brussels. Um, one of the main questions we then want to ask today is how can we support young people from the transition to education or training to work during the pandemic and beyond that? And how can we make sure that we have a more inclusive recovery? And I just want to mention an op-ed article that was written by the two Startnet colleagues here, Jan and uh, Giza, uh, that pretty much puts into place also why it's so important to have this topic on the agenda today. Quickly on the housekeeping rules, this is the boring part. I'm sorry I have to continue with it, but you all know how to use Zoom these days, I hope. Um, you're welcome to ask your questions either in the chat or by raising your hand. Um, there will be breakout sessions, so I hope you all know how that works. You basically will be automatically sent to the breakout sessions um, after the listening part uh, as Mr. Schmidt has joined us, uh, the commissioner. Um, one other mention is that at this event is recorded um, and there's also graphic recording. So Mr. Malapitan, Christopher, um, will take basically put into an image and a graphic recording what we discussed today and we'll quickly discuss it at the end as well. Now on to the introductory remarks because we have the chance to have here Johannes Ebert with us today who is the Secretary General of the Goethe Institute and I will leave you the floor to say a few introductory remarks. Thank you, Sophie. I'm very happy to be here. Dear Commissioners Nicola Schmidt, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear partners, dear colleagues, this is one of the e events which had to be postponed because of COVID-19, because we already wanted to celebrate the three years uh, anniversary of Startnet uh, in April. So I'm very much happy that we succeeded to organize this today. And I also speak in the name of Michael Schwarz, who just called me that on short notice he couldn't take part. So. Uh, his warm greetings also from his side. Uh, when the Goethe Institute and Stiftung Mercator decided to create Startnet in 2016 to support young people in Southern Italy and through partners across Europe, we were swimming a little bit against the tide. Even though, and you mentioned it, youth unemployment figures were gradually going down, certain regions in Europe and certain groups of society remained excluded from the benefits of a prosperous future. In the Apulia region, youth unemployment remained above 40% even during times of economic recovery. And also 63% of Roma youth in Spain are neither in education, employment or training. And of course, we all know when as a young person, one cannot find a job, one often loses trust first in yourself and then in society. And we all know that such a bumpy start into the world of work has tremendous long-term effects on a person's life. 
Today, Sophie, you mentioned it, the context has changed radically. The COVID-19 pandemic is affecting every region, every economy, and in particular young people in an unprecedented way. Many are losing their jobs, remain unemployed, or cannot continue their education as planned. But Europe, of course, cannot afford a lost generation. We at the Goethe Institute know from our experience in the cultural and educational field that complex challenges require alliances. They require cooperation from all sides and sectors in order to create new solutions to achieve a collective impact. And I think this is very important that we have many organizations who work together in StartNet. In our network, we thus link regional institutions, schools, employers, the social sector, and most importantly, of course, the young, people's them, the, the young people themselves to jointly design and implement local solutions for youth transitions. Thereby, new perspectives are opening up to young people who previously were seeing their future only abroad. The Goethe Institute has long-standing experience of working with young people through its different programs. In Italy, we initiated educational cooperation projects that blended language learning with professional training in companies. We built bilingual STEAM parkours that permit young people to discover their talents and interests for their future education and professional career. These experiences are at the origin of StartNet as well as the partnership with Stiftung Mercato. And I really think this is a wonderful and very, very constructive partnership. Today we publish, we are publishing a manual with exciting findings of the first three years of the project. And I just was going through the manual uh, this morning and I was quite impressed about the findings and thank Jan Wilkes and his team for the great work they have done. In this manual, one can discover how to build a regional collective impact network how to gather education, employment, and social sectors to jointly uh, run projects for young people in transition, transition, how to set up European dialogue and partnerships for school to work transitions. I hope our experiences in Southern Italy and beyond can inspire more cross-sectoral cooperation across Europe. This autumn holds a political momentum for Europe. Why? We are not only confronted with new and difficult challenges, but also with new solutions. In July, the European Commission presented a youth employment support package, as you all know. EU programs such as the European Social Fund, Erasmus Plus and Creative Europe will be adopted together with the EU budget for the next seven years and a massive EU recovery plan. And of course, we think that Europe needs to invest more in the field of culture and education to support creative solutions and support for young people. Young people are essential to social cohesion, mutual understanding and citizens' resilience. They are important for the future of Europe. Today's event is meant to connect policy and practice, bringing together policymakers, practitioners and other stakeholders. Only together, and this is important, we can ensure that programs and activities at the grassroots level support young people most effectively during the COVID crisis and beyond. Later in the breakout session, I think, Sophie, you will explain oh, a little God. bit about this. You will discover truly inspiring projects from StartNet and its partners. You will story, hear stories of young people who regained their confidence, who took part in this wonderful program. Even though we cannot suddenly stop the virus or reverse macroeconomic trends by ourselves, we can still make a difference. We can create an impact when it comes to outreach to our young people, to individual guidance and support from an early age. We need education that empowers active and creative citizens for life and the labor market of tomorrow. And I think StartNet can contribute to this and I'm looking very much to today's conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ebert, for these uh, introductory words. Uh, and I don't want to spend too much time because we'll go on to the, the input speech of the commissioner. Maybe one housekeeping rule. Uh, we have 15 minutes to ask questions afterwards. So it's a short Q&A session. So during his speech, you can already um, think of questions and write them in the comment section or raise your hand so I can just take you on straight away um, after Mr. Schmidt finishes his speech. 
Now on to you, uh, Mr. Schmidt, your Commissioner for Jobs and Social Rights. Um, as Mr. Eben mentioned, the Commission published um, the Youth Unemployment Package on the 1st of July. You have the German Council Presidency that also started that hopefully will push for the topic, whether it's the Youth Guarantee, whether it's the reform of the VET policy, so the Vocational Education and Training Policy, or a new impetus with apprenticeship. So. Thank you for being with us today and I'm looking forward to hearing um, your program. Oh, uh, good afternoon all, uh, dear Johannes Ebert, dear Sophie, uh, dear friends. I just want, want to say that I share absolutely every word uh, which uh, you have uh, uh, pronounced in your, in your introductory sp speech and I think uh, uh, indeed, uh, what you are doing is, is, is extremely important for, for the young people in this, uh, in this quite difficult times. Well, last year, the class of 2019 uh, left education to enter the world of work, a period certainly of great changes, of dreams, of great expectations, and also a period of challenges when young people need their friends and organizations like yours to encourage them, to inspire them, and to assist them with very practical advice, such as uh, preparing uh, their CVs. A year has gone by, and so much has changed. The class of 2020 is different. And you mentioned it, some speak again of a lost generation. I believe very firmly it is too early to talk about the lost generation and that we have to do everything possible to prevent that. But the situation is more than challenging. It has challenged everyone at a personal level with the fear of losing loved ones. It has challenged young people who could not attend schools. And as Mr. Wilker from Startnet told me at the previous event, teachers during the shutdown lost contact with one third of students. And it is challenging now as work opportunities are fewer and many young, well-educated, well-trained young people do not find a job. This crisis hit certain countries harder, like Italy, like Spain. And in July, youth unemployment stood at over 30%. And not a day goes by without reading stories about the young and their struggles, like the stories of Goretti, Lucia, and Thomas. Goretti, she is Spanish. She wants to be a nursery school teacher. She was looking for work experience as a substitute teacher, but there are no offers in this field. And for the time being, she works part-time in a jewelry shop. Lucia is Italian from Calabria, and it was already mentioned. She moved to the United Kingdom in search for better opportunities. But before starting her master's degree, she took a year off to work and get practical experience. She applied for 90 jobs in international politics without success. And finally, Thomas is Italian too, he studied law, but he feels the job requirements for young graduates are impossible to comply with, so he continues his studies. All these personal stories reflect the aspirations, the efforts, but also the uh, disappointments for young people. And these three cases just represent millions or hundreds of thousands of young people today. And uh, these thousands of Corettis, Lucia, Thomas, across Europe at the moment, and who are living similar situations as 10 years ago during the financial and economic crisis. And they need people they can turn to. For a start, they have StartNet. And I would like here to pay tribute to the work of the Goethe Institute and the StartNet staff in Southern Italy, but also here in Brussels. You have a true public interest task. You and similar organizations build bridges between people at times when most need it. You give young people again the reason to hope and uh, uh, you strengthen their will 
to continue yeah. Yeah. on their path to realize their projects. But you are not alone in your mission. I must mention other projects such as School Future in Germany, a project also operated by Stiftung Mercator, and many other projects whose managers may be listening. I remember very well the previous crisis, and you referred to it. I was a Minister of Labour when 10 years ago, youth unemployment soared in many member states and soared dramatically. I saw the indignados in the streets of Mad Madrid protesting, and the young all over Europe were the main victims of the financial crisis, and finally nobody came to rescue them. And there was a feeling, well, we rescue the banks, but we forget the young. And it took some time, I have to ad admit that, before the Commission launched the Youth Employment Initiative and the Youth Guarantee. This time, it is different because we cannot accept a new lost generation. Therefore, the Commission reacted immediately. On 1st of July, we put forward the Youth Employment Support Package, Bridge to Jobs. It consists of three main initiatives. First, a reinforced youth guarantee. Second, a proposal for a modernized policy on vocational education and training. And finally, additional youth employment measures in particular for apprenticeships, but also to support job creation for the young. Both the recommendations on the reinforced youth guarantee and the, the one on vocational education and training are on track and will be adopted by the end of this year. And this is indeed urgent, especially as the coronavirus continues to spread and the economy is slow to restart. Adequate funding must go hand in hand. It is why we urged member states to reap the benefits that our funding instruments provide by using the money of the next multi-annual financial framework and the recovery plan. In this respect, we propose that at least 22 billion euro should be spent rapidly on youth employment measures. This has to start promptly. And I know states that a number of member states have made out of youth employment a major priority in their recovery plans. Let me say first a few words on the youth guarantee that was initiated by Commissioner Andor in 2013. As basically every young person experienced, you are asked to have work experience at an age where finally you cannot have any. That is the great paradox of the labor market that makes the transition between education systems and job markets so complex, especially for young people. So you must start somewhere. And that's precisely what is behind the youth guarantee. The current youth guarantee has provided traineeships, education, apprenticeships, or job opportunities to 24 million young people over the past seven years. Since then, the labor market has changed. This is why the youth guarantee is reinforced and updated and must be implemented more quickly let me mention three novelties. First, inequalities are deepening with the COVID-19 crisis, and I would say even before. Therefore, the reinforced youth guarantee will look after people who come with some more difficulties, who are isolated, or victims of discriminations like young people with a disability. Too many have been unemployed for too long. This can leave scarring effects, and you mentioned it in your introductory speech, throughout their entire life. So the youth guarantee must be our net to catch the more vulnerable young people. We must get better at providing them with good opportunities. A second evolution is that young people enter the labor market later than before. In some European countries, the proportion of people aged 25 to 29 years old in educational training has more than doubled between 2010 and 2019. This is why we increase the age range of the eligibility of the youth guarantee. Also the 25 to 29 years old will be beneficiaries. And third, we will make sure we act early and act locally. This is what StarNet does brilliantly in Puglia, in Basilicata, and what the youth guarantee should help with. Education and youth organization will help identify young men and women who are likely to drop out and who therefore need more support. And based on skills, forecasts, the initial training, 
and the offers provided to applicants will be tailored to the needs of local companies. Training for a job is key. Now, I have told you about Goretti, Lucia, and Thomas, but there's also Domenico. He is also Italian, from Bari. He studied computer science, and as an IT graduate, had no difficulty finding a job. Like Domenico, we at the Commission also believe that the future is digital. Nine out of 10 jobs already require some level of digital skills. As a consequence, all registrants to the Youth Guarantee will have their digital skills assessed and potentially developed. And by the way, hundreds of thousands of vacancies exist in the digital sectors. So finally, there is a mix, mismatch between the training, the education, and the jobs uh, uh, offered. As I said, the youth employment support is also about future-proof vocational education and training. Vocational education and training is a great track providing good work opportunities and decent careers. In particular, when combined with work-based learning, for example, through apprenticeships, this is really skilling for a job in the true sense. Vocational training precisely facilitates the transition from school to a job. So we must do our utmost to continue offering apprenticeships now. Therefore, we have renewed the European Alliance for Apprenticeships that has so far brought over 900,000 apprenticeship opportunities. We are renewing it to ensure that apprenticeships offers will be sustained as we need the young apprentices to become the skilled workers in two or three years time when the economy will have picked up again. And we have to support companies also financially, especially SMEs, to continue to offer apprenticeships despite the current difficult economic situation. Dear friends, our influence on the pandemic is to a certain extent quite limited. Hopefully we will find a vaccine and then it may change. But that doesn't mean we cannot do anything. Young people's energy and everything they can learn and achieve to improve their living. Next Generation EU is about your future, the young, the future of the young in a European Union that cares. You are the generation that will shape the future of our union. Together with the support offered today through the youth employment package, the youth guarantee, but also next generation EU funding, I am convinced we will be able to offer the best possible opportunities to every young European. And I want again to thank you for organizing this meeting, even if it's an online meeting, I would like to thank you for, for your investment, for your commitment, uh, for all the help you give uh, uh, to young people to make their dreams become real. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicolas Schmidt, Commissioner. Uh, you're staying with us for another 15 minutes and it's the opportunity now for you to ask questions. And there are already two questions, so I'll jump right in and give the floor to Paolo Nardi, who comes, who is part of the Startnet uh, network from the organization Cometa in Italy. So Paolo Nardi, if you want to speak up, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, for, um, Commissioner, for your speech and also for all the measures that you presented that are great, very, very important for all of us. I work for a vocational training center in Italy. You have been talking about vet, the role of vets, uh, also hire vets uh, for filling the skills mismatch, the skills gap, and also to, uh, let's say, to, to, to solve the current inequalities in terms of employment in Europe. What we are experiencing is that anyway, we have um, many differences among EU countries for instance, in terms of VET and higher VET systems. And in particular, in some countries, of course, in Italy too, <laughs> uh, we, we, we are experiencing a kind of cultural, but also political bias. So VET, notwithstanding its role in, uh, uh, I mean, in terms of transition to work, it's a kind of second best. So I was wondering, uh, how the uh, European Commission 
beside the programs and the projects which are great and very important, but how can you support the system and in particular the actors uh, having actually a role in the vet sector in, uh, in being transition to work? Uh, like StartNet, but also national uh, associations or vet centers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and I'll take a second question as we only have 15 minutes. And I would ask Vincent Verid. I can't see your hand up, but he's also part of the StartNet network, uh, but in Belgium. So please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, dear Commissioner, thank you for your speech. Um, but I would like to draw your attention on flexibility. Um, as you know, one of the future skills. And as an organization, it's important that you can work in, uh, in a flexible way. Uh, certainly, if you work with, uh, with children and young people. And sometimes um, you notice that the project, uh, beautiful on paper, is not working in reality, and then you must have the possibility to quickly change uh, some things, for example, a new methodology, uh, a new time frame, etc. That's not always possible in an agreement with, for example, the European Social Fund. There was an agreement on the indicators, um, but the way uh, it's not always uh, chosen to take into account the sensitivities and points of attention of both partners. And there is no possibility to experiment and to reinvent the project while it's running. So I would insist on a certain degree of flexibility, uh, also on the side of the ESF. Um, so you allow organizations to try new methodologies, um, reach new targets, target groups, um, with the risk that the indicators are not met, um, but that the organizations are sure that they will reach or have the subsidies. So allowing to fail uh, for organizations in trying new methods, uh, new target groups, um, a lot can be learned of that, and it would be more flexible for the organizations but also for the ESF. I know if you have something to react on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The sun just came out in Brussels. I'll take the yeah, <laughs> so I'm sorry true. if that uh, looks like it. It's crazy, <laughs> but sometimes it's sunny in Brussels as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll take a third yeah. question. Uh, if Verena Ringla wants to speak up as she wrote down something quite interesting in the chat. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes, uh, um, dear Commissioner Schmidt and, and uh, all of you, thank you so much. Uh, I had the pleasure when working at Stiftung Mercato to actually initiate uh, StartNet together with Ulrike Tietze in Rome and Johannes Ebert and all the colleagues here. So it's really nice to see so many people involved right now. And I wonder, looking at the future, um, dear Commissioner, if we look uh, beyond the youth guarantee, there is of course uh, the overarching grand goal of, of the European Green Deal. And uh, everything that comes out of the EU and the Green Deal makes a big point saying that the Green Deal has to be a huge inclusion and job boosting program that there should be no person and no place left behind, which is a principle that's beautifully linking up to, to StartNet and all these regional bridges to jobs that we see here in this meeting today. And I wonder in how far your uh, DG can help to boost the EU's investment overall uh, in this, let's say, principle bridge to the jobs of the future, also and additionally under the Green Deal roof in the next decades. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Back to you, Mr. Schmidt. Okay. Um, so, I hope you could remember all the questions, otherwise yeah, I, you can I, ask I, me. I <laughs> so I, the first question, I think this is a, this is a real uh, key question about uh, the perception of VAT uh, in, in many countries, uh, including in those even where VAT is very well and solidly established. And here, I think this is one essential part of our, our efforts now to promote that, to develop that, to show that that is not the second best, 
that VAT does not come after failure, but that VAT is another way to achieve, uh, to achieve uh, uh, a, a very good uh, uh, skilling, but also uh, to achieve for those who are going through the VAT system uh, uh, a self-fulfillment. So I think this is naturally not an easy uh, mission. I was left last week in Osnabrück. The German presidency had convened a meeting on VAT, how to promote VAT, how uh, to strengthen VAT, and there was, we adopted there an Osnabrück declaration precisely uh, on, uh, on the promotion of VAT and precisely uh, trying to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to skip the stereotypes on, 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 on VAT. There are countries where these stereotypes are less strong. Switzerland, for instance, is one of them. Even Austria, what is very strongly established. And then that is not just a way for, for those who work mainly with their hands, although those who work with their hands work with their brain and their hands. Uh, but uh, that has to be broadened. The application of that has to be broadened. If we want first uh, to ease the transition from education to uh, to the job market, to the labor market, but also uh, to prepare people uh, for changing labor market. Because we all know now uh, the profession I have today, the skills I have today, well, I'm now very, very optimistic. In 10 years time, they may have changed totally. So this is also part of reskilling permanently, upskilling permanently people. So in that, term, in that sense, that is, a very strong uh, contribution uh, to uh, a, a professional career where there are a lot of changes, where people have to learn on their job, where they have uh, uh, to adapt, uh, but also uh, for their own benefit, uh, because uh, it might be sometimes boring also to do the same job for 50 years or 40 years. Uh, so I think this is a, a new kind of, of labor market coming up, and here that can be the right solution for many professions, not only to be a, a baker or, or somebody who is uh, uh, repairing cars, but also for many other, and we see, by the way, that many universities and uh, business schools uh, and technical schools, they, they try to integrate that in their curriculum. And so I really encourage you in your, in Italy, I visited, by the way, a center for VAT uh, in uh, near close to Rome, in Rome. So I, I saw that uh, there are a lot of efforts also uh, made in Italy to do that. So I think uh, we, we are working hard on that. But I, when perceptions once are in your mind, it's more difficult to, to get them out. But we are working on that. Yes, flexibility, I agree. Uh, sometimes if you have a good project, uh, during the implementation of your project, you see that it has to be adjusted. Uh, because there are difficulties coming up, or you discover that there are other challenges, other issues which you could not foresee. And so I, I agree that we have, uh, we have to have some flexibility in managing uh, the projects, though this is not so much the commission uh, uh, that does that, it's the indicators, uh, it's also the managing authorities of the member states who have to have a bit more flexible views uh, in uh, in uh, appreciating uh, the, the, the projects. But I, I'm absolutely advocating your idea that we have to be a bit flexible because, well, if a project lasts for two years, there might be new elements uh, which you, you recognize or which you are uh, become aware of, which, which you could not uh, know before you, uh, when you launched the project. So there is also an element of social innovation there. So you have to incorporate also this dimension. Now, yes, I, I agree, uh, inclusiveness uh, is, is key. We, uh, the Commission adopted today uh, its uh, education uh, area, uh, plus also uh, the research and innovation area, plus the digital action plan. So we had today a very, a, a meeting in the Commission very much focused on education, research, knowledge in a broad sense. And one of the ideas going through that is 
Yes, Europe has to be excellent. We have to push for excellency in all areas, education, but also research, innovation, but we have to be inclusive. We have to try to take along a maximum, if possible, everybody along. And because if we, we are not doing that, we will have lost generations all over the years, lost people with a lot of social problems, people who are lost for our economies, but who become also a problem in our societies. So uh, in terms of inequality, in, to, uh, in terms of uh, social exclusion. So inclusion is, is key. Now, linking that to the uh, transformation, be it, by the way, digital or green, um, we have said this commission has, has made out of the Green Deal its big project. And, um, but we have also said this Green Deal has to be uh, very much uh, linked to the social dimension. We do not want to have uh, just a transformation without looking what kind of consequences social consequences this tr uh, transformation uh, will, uh, will bring uh, with it. So therefore, we, we, when we talk about green transition or digital, whatever, we always say just transition. We have to make sure that we have a just transition. And therefore, uh, investment in new jobs, in green jobs is essential. But we have also to make sure that young people, although those who might lose their jobs because their sectors uh, do not correspond anymore to the uh, to these objectives that they are reskilled and they have new opportunities to find one of these green jobs so this is about just transition and uh, we want in the framework of the recovery and resilience plan uh, part of the money to be invested in this just transition because uh, this recovery is not just to recover and to reestablish the economy how it was yesterday. We want to prepare the economy of tomorrow. So a much greener, much, much uh, more sustainable economy, which uh, new kinds of jobs, uh, green jobs, uh, digital jobs. So we have to increase the, the, the skills uh, of young people, but not only of young people, by the way. Um, and therefore, that's the idea of just transition. We have a just transition fund which is managed uh, by my colleague, uh, Elisa Pereira, but uh, in very uh, close connection also with DG Employment. And we will really try to make this transition socially fair, inclusive for everybody. This is the aim, because if we are not doing that, we will not be successful on the just transition, because people will refuse it. When I read in many countries, now people are aware that we have a major challenge climate change. Uh, even in France, I read yesterday or the day before, 60% uh, say we have to accelerate our fight against uh, our policies against climate change. But people assume that if we are doing that, in, by doing that, we have to be socially fair and inclusive. And that's what we try to encourage. That's what we want to be integrated into the uh, recovery and resilience plans. Uh, pr uh, presented by, by the member states. And I'm rather optimistic that uh, we will this time uh, have a fairer and uh, more just transition. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have two more questions. I hope we will manage in the few minutes that are remaining. I would ask William Hayward to speak up, please. Hello, uh, thank you uh, for, for organising the conference and thank you, Commissioner, for, for your speech to present the youth guarantee, the reinforced youth guarantee and all of the work. My question is, uh, what are the next steps for the Commission when it comes to implementing the youth guarantee? Um, when it was first launched in 2013, there was implementation plans from the member states. Um, so will the Commission look into requesting something similar this time to ensure that the member states implement the changes from the reinforcement? Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have a second question from Jean-Luc Stéphanie in the comment section. So if you want to speak up. Okay. So yeah, on the reskilling and upskilling via the education, education and training. I mean, are there already uh, reliable data available uh, which could or which indicate uh, trend 
uh, among young people, including highly qualified ones, which move away from going into office jobs uh, by graduating and then, and then going into more uh, manual type work, uh, including then by, of course, then going for additional professional qualifications, uh, getting apprenticeships, or basically setting out a different uh, life path. Or is that still that currently that that is still mostly foreseen for people which either have no qualifications or little uh, qualifications? Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll add a, a third question uh, concerning mobility, as we saw during the right after the euro crisis that you had lots of yeah, young people been, uh, so moving nice. to moving to different countries, <clears throat> whether. Uh, the Commission plans anything on uh, facilitating mobility as well. Um, I think that's, that hasn't been uh, said yet. So on to you, Mr. Schmidt. Yeah. Well, uh, the first question, uh, certainly we will have to have implementation plans uh, because uh, implementation plans go, uh, go also together with the money, with the resources, with the European funding. So I uh, certainly we, as, as in the past, uh, we will be in close uh, relationship with the member states how they implement the youth guarantee, uh, what their targets are, and uh, and 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 this is this will be uh, very transparent. We will also talk to uh, to youth organizations, to social partners, because it's very important also to have uh, companies on board. Because at the end, uh, we want people to find a job, so we have to include companies also in that. So uh, we we have this participative. Uh, approach uh, and uh, uh, for the implementation plans. Now, um, on the upskilling, I, I, I cannot give you any, any data, but uh, it's clear that uh, there are a lot of efforts to be made. First, we notice that uh, those with very low uh, skills or low education levels, let's call it that, are those who do not get a lot of uh, upskilling or who do not get a lot of long life learning, uh, which is a paradox uh, because those who are the best skilled get the most uh, investment in terms of upskilling. So this is an objective we have said everybody. This also is a, an inclus inclusion objective. We have to invest more in those people who have the, uh, the, 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 the lowest level of skills or the lowest level because a lot of cha change changes will take place also in their jobs. Uh, now, if, if we say, well, 90% of uh, jobs have some kind of digital uh, dimension, well, those persons who do not have a minimum of digital skills, they, they, they are in a risky uh, situation. So this is what we are doing. Now, I, I have no data on that, but I know cases where people finally found out that uh, perhaps they, had a, they were graduates, uh, and that they would like uh, to have a different job, um, a more, more manual job, though I'm always saying, well, it's manual, but it's the, the association of, of your brain and your, and, and, and your hands, uh, and, and that they want to be reskilled in that perspective. So this is something I can easily imagine. And this is also something which uh, at, at the level of our society has to be appreciated and not considered uh, negatively. So this is also, uh, if, if somebody says, my, finally my dream was not to be in an office, but my dream was to be in some more uh, concrete profession or manual profession, well, let's help this person uh, to choose this, uh, this way. Um, on mobility, yes, certainly we, we want young people to be mobile. And uh, we, 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 we strengthen Erasmus, we strengthen Erasmus Plus, the professional Erasmus. That's another aspect, by the way, to promote uh, vocational training. Young people in vocational training should have exactly the same opportunities to have their Erasmus, to have uh, experiences abroad. Unfortunately, when I look at the statistics, I think there are 5% uh, of uh, young people in vocational training who have an Erasmus Plus, and uh, those who are at uh, more university uh, level, they are 30 or 40 percent. So there is a big gap uh, because there are barriers and so on, but this we have to work on that. This is part of our program uh, and, 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 and this will be done. Uh, 
in general terms, mobility. I am in favor of mobility, that's part of Europe. But I do not hope, really, that we will be in the situation as we were uh, 10 years ago, when uh, finally uh, young people had to leave because there was no opportunity for a job, for any uh, possibility. Uh, and they did not perhaps uh, did do that voluntarily. They were forced to do that. I remember even that in one country, uh, a, a prime minister said, well, go away, go away. This is not what mobility means. Mobility cannot be something I'm forced on. Uh, mobility has to be a choice uh, to improve my situation, certainly uh, to uh, acquire new experiences, but it should not come out of a situation uh, of despair. And in 10 years ago, it was out of a situation of despair in many places, especially in, in uh, more in southern, in southern Europe. So yes, we encourage mobility, we support mobility, but it should not come out of a situation of despair. It should come out of uh, a voluntary choice and uh, as a good and solid opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Schmidt. And this is already the end of our, our little discussion. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. And we'll continue to uh, discuss these issues now in breakout rooms. I hope everyone is back and can hear me. Yes, are we good? Perfect. So uh, I hope you all had great conversations in the breakout rooms. Apologies for the slightly brutal uh, redirection into the breakout rooms. Um, Everyone had to stay in, I guess, so that's good. Um, and we have another 25 minutes to kind of sum summarize what has been said in the breakout rooms, to have a poll with you, and also look at the graphic recording that has been done. Um, I didn't have the chance before to say to the other ones what the other uh, sessions were, even though you saw it during the registration to this event, but I I'll quickly go through it. So you, we had session one, which was on social inclusion, we had session two, which was on orientation and career guidance, which was a very interesting discussion. We had um, three key competences, so STEAM, digital skill and entrepreneurship, and four, um, VET and apprenticeship. And um, we had four moderators. So I'll start with Angelica, who was in social inclusion. If you could very quickly, in maybe a minute, summarize what has been said during the breakout session. Yes, thank you, Sophie. Yes, it was uh, very interesting. We had two keynotes about uh, one was about uh, need, how to how to reach them, how to prevent uh, um, to, to the situation of a need and how to reintegrate them. Uh, and the other one was about the situation of Roma in uh, in Spain. And uh, then we were discussing about uh, what kind of funding should be reinforced or should be should be needed to um, to uh, uh, improve the situation of of the vulnerable uh, youth. Uh, first of all, uh, the most important is how to reach them because often these vulnerable groups are, are very marginated and marginated in, uh, in the social context. So it's not that easy to reach them and there should be various um, strategies. Um, uh, the other one is to uh, to work in in networks. So uh, we with our with our Startnet network, we we see that it is very very important to have these multi stakeholder uh, uh, networks where um, different kinds of, um, of 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 social actors uh, work together. So uh, to make to make sure that you reach every every uh, all the contexts you you want uh, to reach to work. Um, very much on the prevention, um, uh, beginning in schools and on reintegration. Very important, and this uh, was coming up when we talked about uh, about Roma. Is even the the digital access they saw uh, in the yes in the in the COVID crisis that many of uh, of the young people didn't have access to uh, digital devices. Uh, they didn't have internet, or they didn't know how to use them. This um, in, uh, in in this context to, to to learn to go to school and so on and it was asked to to do a special funding on this to to fund laptops to fund connectivity um, 
and um, and and even to uh, to train the teachers uh, how to do blended learning with uh, with young young people. Um, and there was a third ex um, aspect which was very interesting uh, is about funding funding uh, in general uh, because. Um, uh, the, the Roma project in, in Spain is funded for seven years with the European um, Social Fund or even more. And this is, um, it's very important to have this midterm or long term perspective. And um, many other countries do not give this possibility um, to, to do a long term um, funding and planning. So uh, every time you have to to, to reach up for one year projects or two year fundings and that's not so easy it, it, it would be and this is even it would be interesting uh, to know if the commission could do something um, to to foster these long-term fundings in the in the single nations thank you very much and um, now on to Geza so please keep a short as well uh, she we were in the uh, breakout session on orientation and career guidance Is yes, here? thank you. Yeah, thank you, here. Sophie. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, orientation and career guidance uh, is actually on the interface of two uh, different sectors. So we have on the one hand the employment sector and then also the education sector that uh, come in there, which makes actually um, it's, a, it's very difficult to, um, to connect those two and which might also make structural changes a bit more difficult. Um, but uh, our group came to the conclusion that actually more efforts need to be done to connect those because um, orientation has uh, an in impact on every person's life and not only during the first transition but throughout life. So um, to really give it the, the attention it needs and uh, regarding this to possibly also include it in a more structural way into school, uh, school curricula so that it is um, not anymore a one day event uh, or anything, but uh, to really allow um, the students, uh, but also the teachers and the parents enough time to get acquainted to the topic and um, to also see all the possibilities that uh, are coming um, along with this, uh, with this topic. And um, this would also give the chance uh, to fight prejudice, uh, which uh, was another um, point brought up that very importantly it is to to show students but also the um, parents that uh, any any um, job could be a good possibility for their for their uh, children as well uh, I think those were the the most important uh, topics I hope I didn't forget anything maybe one that is also like a lifelong uh, thing that uh I think that was a very interesting point. I was in that discussion as well, obviously, yes. that, that we need to think about career orientation, not only for 17, 18 year olds old, but really along the way um, as jobs are changing and that orientation is something for lifelong learning as well. Yes. Um, sorry if I, if I went in there. Uh, on to the third breakout session with key competences and Antonia Blau. Yes. Um... So we had two, uh, after some <laughs> technical problems, we had uh, two inputs by the city of Turku, who developed the STEAM uh, kind of path uh, for, for, uh, for youth, uh, and from Lanzaderas uh, in Spain. Um, and uh, I think uh, what was very beautifully put at one point was that we were always talking about the future and skills of the future, but actually the future is now, because as we see with this pandemic, everything happens digitally. So if now you are uh, unable or you're missing digital skills, even now there is already a gap and there is some sort of a disconnection because you will probably not even be uh, 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 capable of, 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 uh, of participating in offers that are presented now. So to really think also that, you know, we, we are a lot further, I think, to, than what we sometimes think, because the digital is already the basis for a lot of exchanges. Um, we then said, of course, the digital, also the green skills, kind of coming back also to, to one of the questions that uh, Mr. Schmidt answered to. Um, and as a third uh, important skill, also everything that is uh, that can be maybe called civic engagement uh, or civic education. Um, 
what we then were also saying was that um, it's it's the whole uh, topic should be some sort of learning experiences for all stakeholders involved. So it's not only about uh, youth uh, or young people uh, needing to continue to learn, but also companies, for example, that need to be uh, ready and open uh, for a kind of continuous learning environment uh, for everybody. Uh, and because many times that is also a problem that companies are not investing enough for uh, continuous learning uh, and capacity building opportunities. Um, in general, when talking about this cross sectoral uh, cooperation, so on the one hand with um, businesses, but on the other end also, for example, with the educational sector, we were saying that this is sometimes not, um, not easy. Um, uh, that it's also about soft skills, about creative skills. So how can you make sure that these um, are uh, integrated in the educational systems? Um, and that there can be also some sort of a, a danger of an over bureaucratization of things, especially when looking at it from the European level, because everything is, is really kind of organized in these sectors. And even though we can try to work cross sectorial, it can easily get very complicated. And that's why we actually in our group really made again this, let's say, a petition to, to concentrate on the regional level, to really say that this is probably the level where, um, where, where we have some success stories of the different sectors working together. Um, and um, then let's, let's kind of concentrate on these regional success stories uh, and not necessarily kind of only at the at the EU level uh, sectorial um, uh, success stories. And I think what was also very important, okay. something that we mentioned last point at the very end was really that the that the humans that the individual uh, should be at the center of all initiatives. So the needs really of uh, of each and every young person. Um, so it's not the data, as somebody said, but the humans that are central. And it's really a question also of the personal development possibilities of each and every individual. Thank you. Very nice conclusion. And last but not least, we have Vet and Apprenticeships with Jan. Yeah, in our breakout session, we had also two inputs. First one uh, from um, Cometa Formazione on a, on a small ecosystem uh, school enterprise uh, in Como, Northern Italy, that uh, empowers very effectively young people through uh, that. And then an analysis from the city of Mannheim uh, of the situation uh, of that in their city, especially under the context of COVID. And so it was a rather grim uh, situation as, um, yeah, already before the crisis, that was kind of a second choice, but now even more companies are struggling uh, and um, the, the new contracts for, for apprenticeships are going down. Uh, academics uh, studies become kind of a safe harbor. Um, and so we were thinking, how, how can we face those challenges and um, boost uh, vet and apprenticeships? Solutions were, uh, as in other workshops, cooperation. Uh, um, the companies, vet schools, governments, uh, civil society should come together in order to see how can we support each other? How can we support a company that provides uh, apprenticeship spaces? How can we work on, on the promotion? How can we um, uh, create those effective ecosystems? And another point was flexibility. So how can we permit also transitions uh, between uh, uh, vet system, non-vet system, break down a little bit the barriers, permit reskilling, upskilling more, more easily? So kind of uh, try to break down a bit the silo approach and uh, uh, understand a vet uh, also as an approach, as a methodology that can ins be inspiring and innovating the whole education sector. Thank you very much, Jan, and I hope you all enjoyed the conversation on those very important topics. At this point, also thanks to all the Stratner partners that presented in the breakout sessions. Um, I think there were really interesting inputs, at least in the sessions I, I saw, and I imagine also in the others. Um, before I pass on to Jan and Geza, we have a poll uh, where we'd like to ask you what is the main solution regarding youth unemployment? And you have four options and you will see them in a moment on the screen. And the last one is another one, so you can just uh, write it in the comment section. And I'll give you a few minutes or a few seconds to think. Uh. 
Ah, interesting. It's changing. So, oh, it's going up quick. 70% have voted. That's a very good turnout, I would say. No one said other for the moment. Maybe we'll have a 100% turnout, which would be incredible for an election. <laughs> we're at 80%. I think we're good. So, you here you see, um, I think, I hope you can see the result. We see that a closer cooperation between education and employment wins with 60%. Uh, and the second one is modernizing education and training with 26%. And then we have investment in job creation with 10%. So, I guess the bridge to jobs as... <laughs> The title of today's event is, is um, yeah, the one you see as extremely important. Perfect. Thanks so much for the poll. And I would um, give the floor to Yen and Geza to tell you more about the next steps with StartNet and then also do the part with the graphic design. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, some final words from our side, the StartNet project to tell you a little bit um, or what's next, what are our takeaways, uh, what do we do with the outcomes and results of this uh, very inspiring uh, conference. Um, I hope you, you will take a lot uh, of uh, new um, approaches, ideas, uh, discussions uh, away to, to wherever you are based, where you are working. Uh, we will do the same for sure. So our plan is to first collect and compile the results, the, um, all, all all the outcomes from the, the breakout rooms uh, and the plenary and um, uh, distribute them, of course, uh, in cooperation with our partner Euractive through our own communication channels. So please stay posted on this side. We also want to make sure that it uh, will feed into the policy making process. So the European Parliament is working on an opinion on the youth guarantee, on the VET recommendation. The Council under the German presidency will adopt uh, these um, uh, recommendations in, in November. So we want to share this work with the European Parliament, with the Council. We also had a representative from the Committee of the Regions uh, in, in our breakout session writing an opinion about the youth guarantee. So uh, there we, we uh, will di directly be able to channel in um, the results of the conference. So making sure that we are also br bridging, the, uh, um, bridging the gap towards the policymakers back. Um, what are the next steps uh, for the StartNet project? Um, if you got uh, curious, inspired uh, about what we are doing, uh, I would like to invite you very much to have a look at our manual. Um, the Secretary General uh, has already mentioned it. It has just been uh, released and we shared it with you uh, in the background material yesterday. So it's a, it's a nice uh, publication with basically three chapters. Uh, it first tells you a little bit how to work with a collective impact approach. So how do you get together all these sectors on a complex societal challenge and uh, how you mobilize uh, those sectors? Uh, much easier said than done, but you will read more in the publication. Uh, another chapter on the experience in uh, Southern Italy. How did we set up uh, this uh, school to work transition network? How did we create and implement uh, specific projects for young people? And then finally, the third chapter on um, setting up a European dialogue. Uh, how do we create exchanges of good practices and partnerships all across Europe? Um, so uh, you won't be encouraged to have another look at the StartNet manual. Um, uh, we would also like to invite you to an event that is upcoming from our side in two weeks time. We will be back at the Committee of the Regions uh, for the EU uh, Regions Week. Uh, it will be a workshop on the 13th of October on Cohesion 2.0, Innovation through Education and Employment. So looking a little bit at uh, the cohesion funding that is available and how it can be used uh, through um, uh, employment, uh, transition to work and education projects more effectively. I posted a link there. You can register until the 7th of October. These are the next steps where we take the content from this conference, what we are uh, next up to, but Geza will complement a little bit more on the, on the midterm future of the project. So yes, thank you, Jan. Um, 
as you might have uh, heard before, Startnet is currently in its second phase uh, of the project, which will come to an end in the spring of 2023. We are very, very happy that our project continues to grow both on the regional level, but also uh, on the European level. So next to our partner from um, the first three years, we are also now having some new partner organizations, especially uh, from Central and Eastern Europe, which uh, we are very happy about. And um, we are looking forward to have further exchanges of ideas of best practices um, across Europe. And especially also, um, we're looking forward to more possibilities to implement uh, new projects on young people's transition to work. And uh, we are actually also very proud that uh, already three uh, different Erasmus Plus projects have been approved, um, where Startnet partners um, are involved. And the latest one fits also very well to um, this conference here today. It's called uh, Skills for Life. And it focuses on providing educators with the right tools to conduct early career um, guidance and orientation to young teenagers. So just to give you a very quick update on what uh, Startnet is up to. And um, before we are now coming to the end of this great conference and also to the presentation of the uh, live graphic recording, which is produced by Christopher Malapitan, I would just like to ask you to please um, copy the link uh, to our very brief survey, which I just posted into uh, the chat and to um, provide us with your feedback uh, after the conference. That would be very much appreciated. So thank you very much. And now I would like to hand over to Christopher. Please show us what you have done. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I will now share my screen and I will be uh, quickly walking you through some of the highlights that I captured. Of course, if you feel that um, some things were missing and you feel it's very important to include, please reach out to the team and inform them and we will uh, make sure to implement them into this uh, visual before we forward it to you. So let me turn on my screen. If you could, Gisa, can you see this? Yeah, okay, great. All right, so um, I'll briefly say something very general. Uh, a, a great opening from uh, Mr. Ebert uh, setting the scene. Next up, we, we heard from uh, Mr. Schmidt on the, the youth guarantee and how their their focus is on indeed supporting the vulnerable and how this all fits in to the just transition. And I sat in uh, for the, the breakout session on social inclusion. So I was able to get a little bit more on uh, what was shared, which we heard earlier. And here I just quickly captured uh, what was shared in plenary, the focus on connecting both education and employment. Then we had uh, the breakout session on key competences. We don't need to think about the skills of the future because the future is now. And again, of course, always the youth at the center And then finally, the breakout session on VET and apprenticeships. Again, the focus on really pushing uh, support together and as well as being more flexible. So there you have it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for, for that conclusion. I think it was, there's not much to say except that it's really nice to see it uh, as a graphic recording 
and to look back at what has been discussed because I'm sure after two hours, everyone is a bit tired. Um, so thank you so much. I won't say much, much more than thank you to all the participants who joined us today. Thank you to Jan and Geza for the great cooperation. Also to Melanie and Hannah from the Connecting Europe team and the EPC's events team, because we know technically, even though we're all used to Zoom, it's never easy, um, especially when you have breakout sessions and then we need to rechange everything. So thanks to everyone. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about StartNet and its future and hopefully see you at the next event in October. So have a nice Wednesday, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.